Hi, everyone. I'm Noura Akkawi. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, be hosting you all in the continuation of the Spring 2022 Cooper Union School of Architecture Lecture Series. Um, I, um, I just want to start by thanking um, everyone who made this possible, uh, and particularly for tonight, Mauricio Higuera, Stephen Hillier, Jennifer Woodson, Monica Shapiro, and Deans, Nadir Tehrani, and Haley Eber. Um, and especially thank um, also Lias and Yusef Anastas and Stephen Rastow, who agreed to participate in, tonight, in today's event. Um, and before we get into tonight's, uh, this afternoon's program, I wanted to first to mention uh, that on Thursday evening, we have a lecture by Felipe Correa, also on Zoom, organized as part of the student lecture series. So keep an eye out for that. So as part of my coordinating role of this year's lecture series, I uh, had the opportunity to curate a small series that spans across the fall and spring semesters, titled Pluriversal, Bewildered, and Otherwise. It opened last semester by a lecture from Arturo Escobar, and this semester earlier um, in February by a lecture uh, with a lecture by Jack Halverstam. Uh, and if you've missed those, you can also watch them uh, there on our website, whose work, both of their work, inspired this series name. Um, and alongside Escobar and Halberstam, architecture collectives, so cooperatives, publishers, designers, researchers, organizers, whose work is rooted in social and political projects and movements for freedom and justice, who refuse architecture as a tool or service for colonial or capitalist extraction, and who pave paths in their different ways um, towards uh, uh, new forms of practice or other forms of practice. And so I'm, I'm particularly excited to welcome Lias and Yusuf in this context um, and for us all to, to be engaging with uh, how they've been developing their practice over the last decade or so. Um, born into a family of architects, Lias and Yusuf Anastas studied in Paris and both worked there for a while before returning to Bethlehem uh, after winning a competition for a music conservatory. Uh, Lias and Yusuf founded also Local Industries in 2012, a community of artisans and designers dedicated to industrial furniture making and SCALES in 2016, a research department that is constantly enhanced by linking scales that are usually opposed. Their studio's work brings together architecture practice, furniture making, research projects, and cultural initiatives. And I think we will be seeing a lot of that today. Their most recent works include uh, All Purpose, an installation at the 17th Venice Architecture Biennial, Radio Alhara, a community-based online radio with whom we, we, we um, collaborated last semester, um, and the Hebron Courthouse Project and Stone Matters, uh, an experimentation-based research onto the possibilities of stone use in contemporary architecture. Uh, they're also about to launch the Wonder Cabinet in Bethlehem, a cultural endeavor um, aimed to create an art production platform, bringing together artisans and artists. The conversation after their lecture will be moderated um, by Stephen Rustow, Stephen is a professor of architecture at the Cooper Union and principal of Museo Plan, a firm specialized in the design and planning of architecture and cultural for cultural collections. With his partner, Caroline Voss, the firm has designed or collaborated on more than 20 museum and gallery projects in the world, uh, in the US and Europe and Asia, including the Shed in New York City, the Yuan Museum in Beijing, the Museum of Urbanism in Hangzhou, and the National Museum of Bulgaria and Sofia. Thank you so much, Stephen and Lias and Yusef. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nora. Thank you all for inviting us. It's a huge honor to be here virtually tonight. Um, we will uh, we will try to go through different. Um, components or elements of uh, the projects or initiatives that we've been engaged in since um, a certain number of years and try to basically you know uh, use the opportunity of this lecture to think to to think about the different um, uh, subjects on or topics that are transversal to to these different projects um, and maybe they would be formulated as notes or 
as uh, elements that are constituting the basis or the foundations of the way we we work. So we wanted to start with the, this image that um, is from World War II in the uh, Amiens Cathedral. And that is uh, relevant a bit to the times that we're living today, uh, but also to talk about the communalities in between uh, what's happening in uh, Ukraine, what's happening in Palestine, what happened uh, last year in Armenia, and in many other places and through history, uh, this, this idea that um, what's happening there is, uh, is, is, is also a way of um, um, questioning the sort of a supremacist way of uh, uh, making history or a, a way of, uh, of imposing uh, history that is a sort of a, a common thread through these, uh, uh, these um, situations that creates, uh, I mean, this, these communalities and these uh, similarities, these analogies in between those uh, different places uh, create a sort of a, a, a de facto solidarity movement in between, uh, in between different situations, but also in between persons that, is, that creates a, a sort of a global movement. So very specific local conditions that sometimes are very different one from the other, but that create a global solidarity or a global, uh, global analogies, global similarities that are uh, that, that put together become relevant uh, in in some way. So so and this this has been uh, really at the center of um, a, a sub topic of our research on stone that is uh, in uh, that is called um, analogy. And that actually uh, creates traces, similarities, and analogies in between different architectural forms or techniques found in different places and uh, across borders and uh, different um, periods. Uh, that actually questions also the supremacist way of uh, the supremacist understanding or typical sort of uh, understanding of uh, the transmission of knowledge. Um, in more concrete terms, here you can see the on the left hand side the Abbey de Beauchamp in uh, France, and on the right hand side the Saint Anne's Church in Jerusalem. The the one in Jerusalem was built by the Crusaders, but we know for a fact that uh, the Crusaders used some uh, local uh, techniques when they uh, built this particular cupola, and they used these techniques that they found locally in Jerusalem. And the Abbey de Beauchamp, the cupola, has some uh, very similar construction techniques. But this uh, cupola was built after Jerusalem, also by the Crusaders. So this, I, this, this sort of questions the idea that the, the Crusaders were very well known for being masters of stereotomy and of stone construction and transmitting their knowledge all around. But this example in particular is, is somehow questions this, uh, this idea of transmission of knowledge and maybe talks more about uh, a sort of uh, knowledge that travels and knowledge that is uh, constantly nourished by very uh, specific local conditions that when put together become more relevant or become a sort of a network of, uh, of uh, additions of different um, Different stories, different anecdotes. Um, so, so, so this project analogy was um, as, 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 as part of Stone Matters, and Stone Matters is a research project on the use of stone in contemporary architecture. And um, we we have several projects that we did. This one is called Kumt, and it's Kumt in Arabic means uh, lintel, and the lintel here is um, is, is used. Uh, in this particular shape as a, as, a, as a bench, but is built as a lintel. So this lintel that you can see here is in the old city of Bethlehem. And you can see that the interfaces in between the stones are very sophisticated. So these lintels are widespread in the old cities uh, of Bethlehem, uh, Nablus, uh, uh, Jerusalem, all over. And, and, and they're very, very sophisticated. So if you try to imagine the interface in between two stones here, it's not very natural or evident to understand what's happening here geometrically. And the idea is to um, try to create some similarities in between those uh, very specific forms and shapes across borders and across uh, time. So Kant 
uses this um, sort of technique of uh, using uh, interfaces that are very sophisticated, made out of stone, and that um, that create a shape that is um, uh, works like a lintel here used as a bench, but um, is is uh, was. Um, uh, you can see here that the interfaces are um, evolve. So the, the closest you are to the supports and the, the more the interface is ample, let's say in terms of, um, of, of, of uh, stereotomy. So stereotomy for those who uh, don't know is the, um, the way stone is cut in order to assemble different parts of stone in, uh, on, uh, in a larger configuration. Um, this other project is also part of uh, analogy is called the Takane, which is a typology of a vault that is that that the first uh, typology of this vault that we know is from the 11th century and this typology in particular was uh, continuously used until the in Jerusalem at least until the Ottoman period and the particularity of this uh, typology is that it sits on four walls so it's very programmatically very practical, and it's and it and it is um, uh, sort of a practically uh, flat shape. Uh, it sits on four walls, and it's very widespread in common architecture. So it's it's not um, it's an architecture made out of stone, but it is not only used for noble architecture or for uh, um, palaces, etc. It's widespread in 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 in, uh, in common architecture in houses in domestic architecture, which makes it um, more difficult to reference and to um, uh, and to document. So this project was exhibited at the Jerusalem Biennale, and um, it, it 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 refers to that uh, to that particular typology in in the idea of trying to. Um, uh, create a similarity uh, of what, what used to be some uh, an architecture, a domestic architecture, a common architecture, and uh, and, and something that could be uh, integrated into contemporary architecture as a way of uh, creating a, a foundation or a basis for uh, the use of stone or desacralizing the use of stone. So, so, so these different small small stories, small anecdotes. Put together, create a language of architecture, a lexicon that uh, is uh, probably um, something that we would uh, want to use uh, in projects uh, of contemporary um, in contemporary use. So this this uh, this next project is. Um in continuity with this idea of analogy, looks at uh, different approaches in uh, using the material in a, in a, in a massive, uh, constructive way. Uh, we were invited to work on a project in Matera, in the city of Matera in Italy. And the, uh, the city of Matera looks <coughs> architecturally very, it has an architecture that's very similar to the way the, um, uh, the, the city of Jerusalem is composed and the, how the, um, uh, techniques of constructions, or the uh, the, the way um, stone is shapes the city, is very uh, very similar in in the way it looks in the city. But at the same time, the construction technique is very different. So Jerusalem uh, relies on the idea of the cuts, the stereotomy, and the way the assembly creates this, the uh, structural uh, stability of uh, of an edifice. While in Matera, the, uh, the way uh, the buildings are constructed out of stone is uh, based on the idea of carving spaces in, in the rock. So we wanted to explore the idea on how we can bring together these two uh, perspectives or these two visions in, in one uh, methodology of, um, of assemblage or assembly. So the space uh, that was uh, conceived is um, is a meditation space uh, of uh, a surface area of eight square meters, and that uh, is punctuated by, cert by a certain number of openings that would capture um, light and views in a specific way. Um, and it's basically uh, a, a cubical shape that is carved uh, in its core by, uh, by a shape that is uh, corresponding to the uh, scale of a body. But at the same time, it relies as well on the idea of, of stereotomy and um, 
structural stereotomy. So there's an opposition in between the envelope and the way it's uh, inscribed in its context in the city of Matera and how it's carved uh, at, 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 at its core. Um, another another example um, is um, in Jerusalem, um, where we've been invited, we've been commissioned actually to work on an extension of a shop in the monastery, and it's uh, one of the few examples. I mean, one of the oldest examples of Crusaders architecture in Jerusalem. Um, so the the idea here was to create uh, a totally flat stone vault that is uh, entirely woven. It's, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a project that uh, is inspired by the principles of Joseph Abbey, where uh, we have a certain number of uh, stone voussoirs that are brought together and that would create this kind of uh, uh, <coughs> self-standing slab. Yeah, here maybe the uh, insertion in the site, it's inside the monastery in a village called Abu Ghosh, uh, next to Jerusalem or in Jerusalem, but it's a very small uh, village. And this monastery is in the village, and but the monastery is a French uh, domain, a French territory. So uh, the idea was to uh, create a sort of a dialogue with the existing um, uh, Crusaders architecture by creating uh, 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 an architecture that refers to it by the way it's built and not necessarily by its shape or its form. Um, and so these uh, pieces of stone are, are, are built in a, in a sort of a, a way that they, um, they, uh, um, they are weaved. It's a weaved structure, but made out of uh, stone. So very similarly in that approach of analogies and uh, the idea of uh, communal specificities that are uh, traveling beyond borders uh, is the way the radio has been operating since uh, almost two years now. So we, in March 2020, we started um, with a couple of friends, uh, an online radio. Um, and basically, um, the few moments that allowed the radio to reach a certain number of uh, listeners at, at, uh, at, this, at the same time were linked to moments where the uh, listenership was bringing people together from across borders for specific for specific uh, uh, causes. And the first one was uh, this um, global um, online protest that we started uh, as a response to um, the uh, legal uh, and unilateral uh, decision of Israel to annex lands that are uh, around uh, the West Bank. Um, and basically the idea was to bring together a certain number of artists and DJs to protest this, this action. And basically this, um, this online protest brought together 17,000 people. So basically trying to translate the idea of 17,000 people protesting on the public space, but virtually uh, was very interesting. And uh, for us was uh, the, the most interesting part of the project is when the project uh, started, was born actually in, in Palestine, but uh, conglomerated to other localities and tried to mirror uh, other forms of oppression and injustices in other parts of the world. Um, so basically op opening up this platform and opening up the idea of bringing people together uh, to fight uh, op um, forms of oppression, but as well to try to mirror and to create analogies in. Um, in, in, in different uh, conflictual situations. Yeah, so in, in, the, in the exact same way, the, these uh, sort of stone elements were, were trying to trace, uh, uh, let's say the, not the origins, but trace a sort of a network that corresponds to different uh, architectural forms or techniques. Uh, in, in the same way, we ended up by having this uh, uh, network on uh, Radio Al Hara, network of protests that actually uh, traces uh, different um, uh, different uh, oppressions and injustices that are actually linked 
and that become uh, th th that create a movement of solidarity in between those different specificities, very specific situation all across the world that come together uh, and suddenly become relevant only because they uh, they speak about uh, very specific uh, conditions that when put together become suddenly a global uh, a global issue. So, I mean, this this parallelism in between the way the radio functions and uh, the the stone research is something that we actually did not uh, intend uh, to to uh, to find. But we we try. I mean, they, they, we ended up uh, understanding this um, after uh, after uh, after we. Uh, set up this research and we set up the, the radio and we ended up by finding these similarities in between uh, uh, these, the, 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 at the end of the day, the, whether for the radio or the stone, uh, uh, the stone research, the, 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 the main idea is that these two elements are, uh, the, the, this principle is trying to question always a sort of a supremacist way of, uh, of understanding uh, or imposing uh, history in, in, for the stone uh, research uh, on a transmission of knowledge, uh, uh, one that is uh, established, and uh, for the radio, sort of uh, different oppressions. And uh, this this idea is con constantly hunting uh, a bit our projects. So there's a project we just uh, finished in Hebron, that's the courthouse, the Hebron courthouse project. And th this project is also, I mean, uh, once we finished it, we had a new idea about it because the, the, the this project is is, is part of um, a series of projects. Public projects in Palestine are all funded by international aid, implemented by uh, international agencies, and uh, the client being the the Palestinian Authority. And 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 so it it creates this sort of uh, very. Um, very organized or very established way of doing public projects that is um, uh, that creates a, a, maybe a, a way of uh, doing architecture that is very um, in, in a specific that goes into a specific format so it's um, um, a, 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 um, it's, it's a way of um, of, of of having uh, different actors in the project that um, serve a particular agenda. So for example, why a courthouse? A courthouse because maybe we want uh, courthouses for Palestinian people so they become more uh, <laughs> civilized. And uh, maybe uh, why, why, uh, why a courthouse in Palestine? Because maybe, I mean, this, this whole idea of putting a courthouse as a public project in uh, Palestine funded by international aid, which is actually, uh, I mean, international aid is, is, uh, has two two-sided um, sort of um, faces. I mean, without this international fund, there, there wouldn't be any public project in Palestine. But at the same time, this system of international uh, fund is creating a sort of a formatted uh, way of thinking architecture that is uh, to be uh, at least um, uh, to be at least discussed. So, so this project was for us very problematic from that uh, perspective. But we ended up by when we when we did the shooting of the project, we ended up by understanding other stuff about the project that we. In the beginning, we did not intend, but uh, I mean, the project includes a lot of voids. So the the idea is that this project has is, is very big compared to the city, and we wanted it to be inserted or included in the context of the city by having um, a, a global shape that includes a lot of voids, and uh, voids that voids that could be or, or, or empty spaces that could be in the future in 50 100 200 years be transformed into public spaces and the the, um, the and the envelope of the project is uh, so, somehow um, thought as a sort of a variable um, uh, is made out of variable uh, sized windows that actually refer to uh, a, a specific um, typology 
of uh, porosity that can be found in the old city of uh, Hebron in particular, but all over Palestinian cities. So the idea was to relate, try to include this huge or this massive scale building into the city by creating landmarks that people um, uh, would refer to. And so this, the, the, this, um, uh, this idea was for us a way of inserting the, um, the building in, into the city. But then we realized now that this, uh, that maybe architecture, the architecture of this project is actually resisting the entire setup um, uh, in which it was uh, created. So maybe the, its architecture is contesting the, the, um, the, the mere fact that it exists. Maybe in, the, in this entire apparatus of, uh, of the way public buildings are created in Palestine, depending on international funding and all the mechanisms that are put in place in order to produce these architectures um, with, with, with specific agendas. One of the things that we wanted to try to fight with that project is the idea of giving the possibility of uh, uh, creating an architecture that would be uh, constructable by any uh, contractor. So basically the, the idea was as well to uh, minimize the uh, POQ of the project to, up to a certain extent that it would be, uh, that would actually break this idea of uh, supremacy and this idea of uh, segregating or opening up projects, public projects to very specific, um, to very specific circles. Yeah, so this idea of creating a, a way of building the project or a way of uh, thinking the architecture of the project uh, uh, that that makes its building accessible to any um, uh, to, to a contractor of any scale, not necessarily big firms, but try to the components of the architectural project are made to be uh, sized for a contractor of a moderate scale. So not only to open up the, the project to, to multiple actors, but also to try to um, uh, think of this scale of uh, the intermediate scale that uh, could be something that is um, built in a, in a proper way or in a, in, in a more, uh, in a more um, proper way than something that is very uh, uh, large and big. So th this idea of the intermediate scale, making architecture at an intermediate scale is also a theme that we've been exploring with uh, another of our initiatives, uh, uh, local industries. So local industries started as a furniture um, uh, making project with art, art project with artisans all around the city. But it, 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 in fact, it is a, a project that uh, investigates the way of producing intermediate scaled objects and uh, pieces of furniture that sometimes become architecture or architecture that becomes sometimes pieces of furniture. So this intermediate scale in between furniture and architecture that uh, is um, something that is very rich for us because it uh, makes use of artisans or we work directly with the artisans to build architecture. So it makes, um, so it, it has the ability of, uh, of having uh, very skilled artisans working on projects that are uh, not only small objects, but architecture. And it, it, it ends up by creating, a, uh, maybe not in, a, in, in the shape or not in the, in, 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 in the techniques, but in the, in the, in, in the, um, in, in the final production, it creates something that is very uh, peculiar because it's uh, 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 a work that is done by uh, artisans at a scale that they're not used to work with. So, as you, as you was mentioning, one of the one of the uh, <coughs> things that is really interesting to us in Palestine is that we, unlike other other parts of the world, there's still uh, the possibility of working very closely with or basically having access to uh, to crafts still in Palestine. And we're very much interested in the idea on exploring how the city is crafted by, uh, by artisans and how the um, techniques of construction have an impact on the city morphology and basically going from the scale of uh, working on 
constructive details or on stereotomy, for example, how it can create very specific ways of uh, absorbing or using the city. Um, this is an image of uh, an olive wood artisan in, in Bethlehem. Um, as you know, and as you may know, Bethlehem relies on uh, seventy percent or eighty percent of the economy of the city relies on tourism, um, and this tourism has been um, <coughs> developing or evolving in a way that is uh, uh, following uh, globalized tendencies, where uh, the artisan is. Uh, slowly uh, vanishing into that system and all the know-hows and all the uh, local resources and local materials are being gradually replaced by um, competitive uh, uh, imported uh, options. So one of the targets as well of local industries is uh, the idea of uh, having this constant evolving network of producers artisans, engineers, architects, looking together uh, at how we can push the boundaries of uh, scales and how uh, looking at um, this idea of technique applied on, on, on opposing basically the idea of scales. So for example, we worked with, this, with that specific artisan that is usually working on a very low scale uh, producing uh, statues uh, on a scale of architecture, on a, on a scale of a space. So this olive wood uh, structure is um, uses actually all the techniques and all the machinery that are usually used to create small artifacts, to, to create a, a structural principle uh, based on a weaving process of uh, olive plaques, olive wood plaques. So, the succession of actually these different projects, um, whether within um, our architecture studio or local industries and the radio, um, pushed us to create a new uh, space that is um, that will open this year, and it's basically opening up this uh, this way of uh, looking at the city and looking at different disciplines and looking at. Um, how these uh, th these forms of contamination can br be brought together in one space, and how they can um, achieve or um, uh, reach results that are usually unexpected, and in, 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 uh, to, to reach actually new mediums of production. So the Wonder Cabinet is a space that it's a cultural platform that is uh, focusing on the idea of production, so learning through the making, um, and it's uh, it will uh, it will offer the possibility to. Um, artisans or makers to work closely with other forms of disciplines and to maybe um, suggest new ways of, of uh, producing the city. I mean, mainly the Wonder Cabinet is also a place where we um, would like to, um, I mean, putting it simply break some barriers in, in the society, but also in the way the system of um, uh, production and artisanship is uh, organized. So uh, in, 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 from one end, uh, putting together in one space artisans and artists and architects and engineers, makers in one space and tr trying to, to create a production label that is, uh, that is based on this idea of uh, uh, gathering uh, uh, gathering makers in order to try to uh, re-question um, established rules or established uh, ways of uh, thinking, which uh, is actually um, something that um, is linked to the stone research that we're doing, because the, the entire thing started as a questioning of uh, a law that we inherited from the uh, British mandate, the, a bylaw of 1918, which actually was in, uh, established in Jerusalem, where um, all buildings were to be covered with stone, uh, officially to make the city more uh, uniform or homogeneous in terms of uh, a built landscape. But um, de facto, this created a sort of a political, uh, uh, a political um, use of stone, uh, specifically in Jerusalem, because the uh, the after this bylaw was um, applied, what 
everything that wasn't built out of stone was de facto out of Jerusalem, or at least in the imaginary was out of Jerusalem. And the new constructions, the new uh, housing, uh, then the, 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 the idea of conquering Jerusalem or reclaiming Jerusalem was also built around the, the around stone and building um, uh, housing projects or big uh, projects that are built uh, out of stone on the outskirts of Jerusalem, which um, at the time weren't uh, completely inside Jerusalem, but building them out of stone would actually uh, inscribe them in the imaginary of people inside Jerusalem. So this idea of um, and this had an implication on the techniques used for stone, and uh, and this law was is, is uh, w w started in Jerusalem, but then was applied on uh, practically all the Palestinian cities, and is still applied today, uh, except that today the stone that is used for uh, uh, buildings, so every building has to be covered with stone, but today is only. Um, uh, veneer or only stone that is um, cladding, which is the same globally. I mean, in, in all in all the countries in the world, we use stone mainly, not not always, but mainly as a as a um, cladding material. But in Palestine specifically, it is linked to all these uh, uh, multi-layered agendas: political, cultural, environmental, uh, economical, etc. And we also have a stone that is. Uh, widely available. So um, <clears throat> we have quarries that are all around the, the country. So uh, and, and the limestone we have is a limestone that can be, uh, in fact, used for structural purposes. So the idea of using it only as a cladding material or between brackets only as a, as a cla cladding material was a sort of um, uh, the, the stone research project started as a reaction to that uh, to that specific uh, condition of the use of stone, and um, and, uh, and it, it, it related to all these uh, ways of uh, using stone. So, so for example, the stone quarries are all located in uh, in areas in Palestinian areas. Um, the reason for that is that the I think there are two main reasons. One of them is that um, the environmental laws in uh, Israel are strict enough for uh, quarries not to exist. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the the quarries that are in the Palestinian areas are overused to feed the Israeli and the Palestinian market and the international market. So there's an, there's an over uh, use of stone quarries resulting in a um, pollution of the landscape, uh, in polluting the surrounding villages, creating diseases, etc. And um, <clears throat> so we, we we've been as well one of the one, <coughs> one of the subtopics that we're uh, very much interested in is the idea of um, the uh, use of this material, the use of stone, and uh, as a as a structural component in architecture and its link to nature and how uh, architecture in Palestine had a very strong link. Uh, to the uh, formation of nature and how the, the, the dense nucleus that was found in the city centers had a, a very specific relationship to the uh, landscapes and the, uh, the uh, areas around the city centers. So this is an image of the Kremizan Valley in uh, the peripheries of Bethlehem. That is an area that um, is in uh, the area C, which is a kind of military a military zone that is uh, threatened to be expropriated. Um, and one of the themes as well that comes in, in that specific um, topic is the idea of the curve. And if we look at the inherited architecture of <coughs> Palestine in between the 30s and 70s, <coughs> most of the buildings uh, had the, the idea of the curve. And the curve was uh, used as a medium to connect uh, buildings to the landscape. Because most of the uh, of most of the landscapes or most of the lands in Palestine are very have very rich uh, topography topography lines, and th that medium of the curve was uh, very strong and very present in in, in the architectural morphology of the city. So we started working on that project that was commissioned by the Victoria and Albert Albert Museum in London. 
And the, the idea was to link this idea of uh, the technique of construction uh, to, um, to a way uh, to, to a way at looking at um, um, the relationship between architecture and nature and how it's, it has been disrupted during the last the last uh, 40 years due to due to the uh, ongoing um, political conditions but as well due to the um, globalized way of uh, producing architecture so since israel decided to annex this piece of land uh, there's a very there's a there's a monastery actually that uh, has been in place in that area since um, the 18 since 1850 and basically, the local community uh, around the monastery started Friday gatherings uh, that uh, started by being um, uh, religious celebrations in the mountains, trying to protest the passage of the wall. And gradually, they started bringing in different parts of the community. So they started being more and more uh, forms of meditations in, in the valley. Uh, and gradually, the idea of protestation became as well absorbed actually the idea of um, being in the nature and reflecting on um, the uh, very strong link uh, Palestinians have with with the land and with nature. So basically the idea for, for that project was to explore again this idea of the curve um, by, you, by creating a architectural form that would uh, mark the presence of um, this community in that specific land in an area that where architecture is not allowed uh, any modification on uh, on, uh, on lands or the public space is, is totally forbidden so the project has been installed there as a marker a marker of property and trying to emphasize um, the link the historical link that uh, architecture uh, in palestine had with nature so the entire the entire structure is conceived with 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 curves uh, and curves that have um, a structural role in the structure, and every single stone piece uh, that was carved here plays exactly plays basically the exact same role as uh, all the others. Uh, they they are um, they hold each other's mutually and create the the totally uh, uh, stability of the structure. The the, uh, the the idea as well of the project was to th to think about um, the uh, musification of objects and projects that or or or, or objects that are musified and uh, and the trajectory of these objects that become part of an archive or part of a storage and a museum and how they can be how after a while they can be given away and repositioned in, in real life. So the, the project was born at the VNA and came back to came back to Palestine uh, in the valley and now it's uh, being used as a communal as a communal space. So in fact this idea of the, the curve being uh, a very important element in the uh, in, in the Palestinian modernist uh, architecture as a way of uh, uh, as, as, as a Palestinian twist to the modernist architecture in order to uh, integrate it into the uh, curvy landscapes um, and, and so all of these uh, it created sort of a language of buildings built in between the 30s and 70s like Yas was uh, saying that were that were kind of um, modern architecture but with with, with some curves that um, relate to the landscape and uh, unfortunately today these uh, specifically these uh, buildings are being uh, um, not all of them but a, a lot of them there's a trend of uh, these buildings being demolished uh, uh, to be replaced by uh, real investor real estate uh, uh, projects etc so th th there's a law that protects all buildings that were built before 1917. But the problem is that 1917 is a very arbitrary date. And so everything that was built after 1917 is officially not protected uh, by the law. So all of these um, 
uh, buildings are being demolished, which is a really interesting period of architecture, not only because of this uh, sort of uh, uh, modernist uh, uh, take, uh, 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 this, 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 this architecture that uh, a bit twists modernist uh, uh, style, but also because the, it, it corresponds to a period where uh, the composition of the, of the walls of, uh, of, of, of um, of a, of a building were actually not completely made out of concrete. So we passed from having structural stone to having clad stone, but in between, which corresponds to that period, we had a sort of a composite wall that was made out of sort of fill slash concrete, some sort of concrete and stones that were thick and that were um, shaped from their inner side to be completely uh, composite or to be to, to, to interact with the, with the, fill slash concrete uh, part of the wall. So it was a sort of a, a, a hybrid wall that was structural and, and that corresponded to that period. And uh, unfortunately, we, 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 we are uh, uh, losing those, um, those buildings uh, progressively. Um, so, and so what the interesting part is that the, the, the stones that were used for this um, uh, for, for this kind of architecture are, are stones that are thick enough to be reused. So the idea is also to think that clad stone, uh, I mean, in, in terms of reuse of materials, clad stone is, is, is a stone that is uh, uh, two to five centimeters thick. And that is maybe more difficult to reuse as a, as a structural component or as, a, as an architectural element in the in, in in the future, and these these buildings were have stones that are thick enough to be uh, to be at least uh, um, um, questions uh, to be at least uh, uh, evaluated to be reused. So that's that's uh, something that we did for. Uh, so this is another building that is from that same period built in the same way and so what we one of our projects in the stone matters research is to use these uh, stones of a demolished building to create a new architectural column that could be used for uh, contemporary uh, buildings the one that you see here is uh, is made out of um, <clears throat> collected stones from a demolished building in bethlehem um, and so we uh, you, you can see that the stones have <coughs> sorry have one face that is more or less straight that corresponds to the facade of the building and the other one that is um, more like a uh, how do you call it more, more like massive. A, a massive uh, sort of uh, geometry that corresponds to the inner side of the wall where it, it had this composite um, aspect of uh, of the wall and so in in, in that uh, in that project we tried to um, we collected those stones we scanned them and we, we had a, a proper 3D model of each one of the stones that we uh, then worked on to create this uh, architectural uh, column that was made out of these salvaged stones and some new stones in between that uh, were um, cut in a certain way that uh, corresponded to the exact same geometry of the old stones in order to create a sort of a vertical column. Um, which, which, which brings us brings us actually to um, the all purpose, which I mean, the, the, this, this whole um, idea of stone matters at the end of the day is to create a vocabulary or a lexicon of architectural elements made out of stone, a column, the lintel, uh, the vault, the um, uh, these uh, different, the wall, uh, these different um, uh, elements, uh, elements of architecture that um, we tried to create a sort of um, a typological architecture at the Venice Biennale with this project called All Purpose. All Purpose. Uh, this project was about, um, not, not specifically about techniques, but more about architecture and about spaces, about creating architecture that corresponds uh, to a material, but not only, but to a way of living. So this, this, uh, this project at the scale of the Biennale, it was on an abstract scale because, because of its size, but the idea was to create a sort of um, a covering, a shelter that is made out of stone that has two uh, main domes that are separated with other vaults that are interstitial spaces. And the, the, these, um, th th this, um, 
this shelter or this roof creates a functioning implant that corresponds to a household uh, uh, typology. So it's a, it's a typology of a house that is um, uh, uh, made out of stone. So there's a direct relation in between the material, the structure, the architecture, and the space it creates, it generates. Um, uh, so, so, so it's somehow for us uh, sort of a, um, a first more global uh, approach to the uh, elements of architecture combined together to create a typological architectural space that is not only about techniques and uh, stone uh, uh, assembly, etc., but also about uh, uh, questioning the way, the, the, the very practical way of building uh, with stone, with structural stone in, in our uh, contemporary era. What we try to explore here is the idea that basically the structure is uh, reverberated on the architecture and where uh, the structure is not only uh, answering questions of uh, solidness and uh, ways of creating building that can sustain um, um, uh, uh, live loads and red loads, etc. But it's basically the idea on how the structure itself creates a typological space and how uh, the, um, the, arch the, the, uh, the architecture would fill in that kind of gap uh, of structure. And so basically that idea of infrastructural architecture is as well something that <coughs> we are trying to look at and how, um, uh, how the city is constantly renewed and how these uh, buildings essentially made out of stone can be uh, can accommodate different functions over time and then have the possibility of to transform uh, and adapt to uh, contemporary needs of the city. Um, so we, we started working on a project for an art foundation in Amman in Jordan, where we're trying to explore the idea of creating an infrastructure made out of stone. So going from the scale of looking at elements of architecture to uh, a, larger, a larger scale that looks at the city and how an infrastructure made out of stone can offer new possibilities uh, in, in a city. Um, so the, the, um, the, uh, the building that is suggested uh, is, um, has a, a width of 14 meters uh, and is, is um, composed by a certain number of stone bolts uh, that are designed uh, for, for the current specific needs of, of the foundation, but that, as, that are as well imagined as spaces that can evolve in time uh, while maintaining the, uh, the idea of, uh, of, of the infrastructure. Which relates also to the um, idea we we're mentioning about opposing this uh, um, <clears throat> established idea about the uh, use of stone for uh, noble architecture and the use of stone in domestic architecture. So in this infrastructure, uh, the um, fr from from very th there's a different scale of reading of the building. So from very far away, you can only see some very massive. Uh, sort of slabs uh, that, that resembles uh, uh, an infrastructure that connects actually the, 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 the foundation, the art foundation to the city. And as you uh, approach the building, you start discovering some details and some uh, uh, sophisticated um, uh, cuts of uh, stone and uh, architecture that becomes very domestic. So when you're inside the space, you have a reading of the space that is completely uh, different than the one you have from the from the city. And actually, it it refers uh, quite directly to historical uh, historical, <coughs> historical examples of architecture that are produced uh, in Palestine, which is, for example, that, sorry, which is uh, that building uh, from uh, the eighteenth century. That we are currently restoring, and that that had multiple forms of use over the years. And the, uh, as you can see on on the left on the left side image, uh, it has um, um, it has uh, spaces that are uh, depending on 
the uh, the structural uh, the, the st structural principles principles used to construct the building, and uh, that allow uh, flexibility and uh, different forms of use. Um, and it's basically it was really interesting to try to think of, on how that specific building that was used as a, uh, as a residential space how it can transform and become uh, a public space a public communal um, communal space um, so we 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 try to look at two elements that would uh, allow in the passage from this kind of domestic scale to uh, a scale that applies to the city and uh, one of the main components was how to move vertically in that building in, in that building and how the vertical uh, system that was initially used had was uh, more adapted to uh, scale of, uh, of a household and how it can transform into um, something that would uh, connect the building to the street um, and to the city so there's a new uh, kind of uh, uh, there's a new way to travel around the building with uh, kind of sculptural stairways um, and and basically the last floor of the building was never completed because of uh, of the war so we're completing the last floor with um, this um, stone structure that uh, kind of pays homage to the different vaults that are found throughout the building and allows the city to overlook uh, the uh, the bottom surface of that vault from from different point of views Yeah, we're in the final phases of construction. So, so these these old uh, <clears throat> these old uh, buildings, are, I mean, the old city, the old cities in in in, uh, in, in Palestine have, have are, are made out of um, typological spaces and uh, not at all iconic uh, uh, architecture, but rather typological architecture so you 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 will probably not remember one building of an old city but rather uh, typologies of uh, architecture that are found in the old cities and these typologies are really interesting because they allow for uh, transformation and for reuse and for adaptability of the spaces and because they're they're um, typologies that can be uh, transformed and adapted in a certain way because they're generic because they're typologies they, they they are more <clears throat> um, they are more um, uh, they have the capacity of changing and they have the capacity of uh, of of, uh, of being um, uh, transformed into other uh, into other spaces into new uses etc. So these this idea of typological spaces being uh, uh, at the center of uh, Palestinian old cities is what we used in that project. Um, which is, I think, the last one we're presenting here is a uh, it's, it's a huge site on the limit of the desert in between Bethlehem and the uh, and the desert. It's it's it really stands at the limit in, in between the city and the desert. And there was a very um, very weird brief for this uh, competition, uh, which actually uh, stated that they wanted a project outside of the city of Bethlehem that would uh, 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 that would be um, a folkloric city for tourists that can, can't come to Bethlehem, so they would go to that city to visit fake Bethlehem in an environment that is in the middle of the desert uh, on the outskirts of Bethlehem. So this was a very, very weird uh, uh, brief that we... That, that we in, in the beginning we didn't want to participate in that competition but then we tried to use this idea of typological spaces to answer this competition in a way that is a bit um, <clears throat> different from what the brief was uh, suggesting so we lost but the idea was to uh, create these typological spaces as as um, as connectors or as um, uh, spaces that would refer to, to, to the city of uh, Bethlehem, or at least to the urban uh, morphology of the city. So these spaces were actually uh, formalized into some sort of uh, objects that were put on a very, very large site. So it was basically 
uh, we thought of it as, as a sort of a, a more like a park that was punctuated by objects. And these objects were sculptures that were referring to typological spaces of the city. So, uh, so, so, I mean, for the for the competition, it was very very uh, probable that we were going to lose. But the the it was for us an exercise to um, explore further on a very abstract level the typological spaces and the way that they, they can be played with. And I think that's the last part. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Shukran, thank you so much. Um, this has been amazing. I can listen to you for another couple of hours uh, happily about your work. Um, I want to invite Stephen to join the conversation. Well, let me start by thanking you, just as Nora said. I think we could go on looking at at least as many images as you've already shown us. And uh, uh, it's an absolutely marvelous presentation of a wonderful body of work. Um, one of the things that impresses me most directly and goes, I think, to the heart of what you've been uh, showing us from the outset is this decision to center the work on its materiality. And in doing so, I think to evoke an entire ecology that includes uh, political economic questions, questions of fabrications, questions of historical tradition, questions of the value of labor. And all of these in your telling derive from the decision to use a particular material. So in some sense, you could say that you've located the material in an ecological sense that includes all of these other aspects. And I think that um, both in terms of the particular school to whom you're speaking, in which questions of form historically have sometimes been divorced from questions of material, and to the larger architectural discourse in this moment where questions of material, uh, materiality are often seen as secondary, your work stands as really a marvelous corrective um, and very, very beautiful simply on its own terms. Um, so what I'd like to do is just to uh, start with a couple of uh, prompts or questions to uh, get you to continue the uh, exposition of uh, your work. And as I'm doing that, I think uh, we can ask uh, people in the audience either to add questions in the chat. Um, I'll, I have two or three, but um, after that, uh, as long as time permits, we can continue to take questions. Or if you prefer to ask your question uh, directly, uh, just let us know um, by uh, raising your virtual hand. And so after five or 10 minutes, we can open the discussion up to the larger group. Um, the first question that occurs to me is really uh, something that goes to the process that you engage in um, examining each project. And it's a bit of a chicken and egg uh, question. Um, do you find that the material dictates the formal considerations that you then apply to the particular site or the particular proposal? Or is there a formal um, response that then gets interpreted in the specific ways in which you work with the material? Or is that formal material distinction really irrelevant at this point in your work? I think it, it really, it, it's, a, it's a combination of, uh, of the two things, because when you look, for example, at one of the last projects that we've uh, shown, for example, the Art Foundation with uh, the idea of working with uh, stone to create an infrastructural building is a bit crazy because, uh, you know, doing big spans with um, uh, massive stone construction principle is, uh, was a bit uh, a challenging idea. But at the same time, uh, so I think this as well, the idea of, uh, uh, having the excitement to work with the specific material, but as well trying to link it within specific conditions and specific contexts that maybe can add something uh, to the discourse of in, in the city. Um, yeah, I, I think that, I think, I think it's always related to the material, 
but before it's related to the material, it's always uh, related to the site because the the um, <clears throat> I mean even in the in the projects uh, of uh, experimentations with the stone structures, the stone structures were always uh, implemented in a specific site um, with which they had an interaction or the. Or, or else it wouldn't be architecture. So the the the, the idea of uh, uh, exploring the material only for its uh, specific uh, uh, inherent properties is, is not for us very interesting as much as uh, doing this while considering the site it's inscribed in. I mean, I mean looking at the different, uh, one of the examples that, we, that, we, uh, that we've shown, um, this household or th this vertical structure in the old city that was built uh, in the, the late uh, 18th century uh, is basically entirely uh, conceived uh, with the idea of the technique and the technique basically created uh, the form of the building itself so the, basically that kind of vertical uh, void at the core of the building and how this um, kind of semi uh, public space and the heart of the building connects the building with its neighborhood and with the city. Uh, is, has a direct link to the methodology used to construct it. So there's always this kind of uh, tension in between um, the formation of uh, the architecture and how it's inscribed in a very specific context. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that in other contexts you would be willing or excited about extending the same approach to the work to other kinds of materials, so that in, for example, uh, were you asked to work in a setting in which wood was the dominant construction material, there would be um, a transposition of that kind of research to different ways of making form in a new material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think definitely, but actually the, uh, <clears throat> the fact that we uh, are working with stone, it, is not linked to the material, but it's linked to the site. Of course. It's, to, it's, it's linked to the way stone is used here, the way it was used, the, the historical uh, approach to stone, the way uh, that the, the, the limestone that is widely available here, it's, its typology, etc. cetera. And, uh, and actually it makes also, I mean, um, it, one part of it is a sort of a, a, sort of a, a challenge towards uh, how we're using stone in this part of the world, but it, 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 it has also a resonance with the other parts of the world where stone is also being uh, reused as a structural material and uh, explorations of, uh, uh, I mean, here it, 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 uh, it, it also makes sense uh, with regards to the, to, the, um, uh, to the stone queries in, in, in Palestine, we, you, you have two main uh, areas of stone quarries, one in, in the north and one in the south. And because it's not uh, such a big country, uh, in every city you have access to uh, to the material in a way that makes it um, uh, even on a, on a life cycle assessment uh, point of view very um, uh, relevant. So I think the, the the exploration of the material is not really. Uh, something that uh, em emanates from a uh, sort of uh, laboratory approach, but rather an architectural uh, approach that ended up investigating a material. Mm -hmm. I mean, its presence in, I mean, the way, the way it has been uh, uh, anchored in the city would, uh, I mean, the, the, the reason why we use stone uh, for so long in Pakistan is because of the quality of the limestone that we have and the, the abundance of the quarries. And basically, as well, the way stone interacted with the climatic conditions that we had. And basically, the only, I mean, the only, uh, what is left today out of 90% of what is, or maybe 99% of what's currently built in stone is only the appearance. And none of the uh, structural or thermal components are kind of preserved. So, but this is as well, as you mentioned earlier, is this idea, I mean, this is, um, a globalized uh, perspective on how architecture is, uh, for example, looking, we had this as well experience in France where, you know, with all these codifications and all these ISOs and all these uh, um, uh, labels that we have to abide with in order to have uh, green certifications or 
you know, uh, sustainable, um, sustainable structures and architecture is basically going uh, against all the principles of uh, creating contextual and architecture that is described in a, in a responsible, uh, um, I mean, basically following a, a responsible approach to producing it. I'd love to go back to some of the things that you said earlier about stereotomy, because it seems to me that there's, uh, there are all sorts of very interesting implications for this notion that what used to be a body of knowledge that was essentially secret and was guarded amongst a group of masons uh, and passed along from generation to generation has with the advent of computer assisted design become something which is now essentially available um, to, to nearly everyone. Um, and that your use of CAD in exploring and revealing the structures that stereo stereotomy can now allow for, it seems to me suggests several interesting um, directions in which the work could be developed. And I'm wondering if you've considered some of them. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the project that you showed while we wait and the Premison Valley Tower suggests the extraordinary um, beauty and generative capacity in using a single repeated uh, piece. And it suggests a whole line of thinking that goes back to the ideas of a kit of parts of uh, a very simple module or block that could even be produced on um, a small industrial scale and made available to people who don't necessarily have considerable training in masonry uh, and used to extraordinary um, formal and uh, constructive ends in that way. But at the same time, you put a great deal of emphasis on the role of artisanal labor and the craft traditions that exist in um, the very specific setting in which you're working. So I'm wondering if stereotomy is a tool that helps you, in some sense, incorporate other kinds of craft knowledge into different modes of production, or if it also holds this possibility or this promise of being something that could be scaled up in a way that would provide uh, means and methods of making new kinds of environments at a larger scale. <laughs> just thinking out loud but you know one one of the uh, we didn't include in that presentation but one of the images that we usually use um for presentations is how the for example one uh, the big cities in palestine Ramallah, or nablus or hebron the way they look today is directly linked to um the, to the technique of construction. So basically all the buildings look alike because of the construction technique. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we, we hope basically that um, exploring uh, structural principles and using stone can as well compete, uh, create a kind of competition in the way uh, traditional architecture is um, being put together today in Palestine, which is uh, essentially uh, concrete skeletons uh, cladded with stone. So basically, but the problem is that basically most of the um, stone masons and stone factories um, that are based in Palestine now work, most of their markets are for um, export and basically are essentially linked to creating um, fake paradio villas and, uh, you know, ornamental structures. So there's always this kind of uh, uh, equilibrium that has has to be made. But I think I mean, looking at the city, how it evolves during the last 50 years and seeing that one construction principle or, or one construction procedure that got kind of democratized so quickly uh, keeps uh, keeps the door open towards um, maybe suggesting new formats and, and, and the use of the material. Yeah, I guess that the, 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 the <clears throat> I mean, one of the, um, uh, not proofs, but let's say the, the, the use of stone, uh, I mean, it, it refers also to your previous question about the material, but because the use of stone was, uh, was made, um, 
I mean, all buildings have to be made out of stone here. Mm -hmm. So in a way you could say that this, this would generate, uh, uh, if you look at it from a material perspective, this would generate uh, an architecture that is rich. And on the contrary, it's, it, it, it ended up creating an architecture that is completely poor, that is sad, that is uh, very uh, capitalistic and that is very, um, it, that is ignore, ignoring every single uh, landmark or reference of uh, Palestinian architecture, uh, which is all built out of stone. So, 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 so the, the, the material can be uh, very quickly uh, perverted into, uh, into something that is uh, out of control in the same way these uh, factories are building uh, uh, Corinthian uh, capitals and uh, doing very, uh, very um, detailed and ornamental pieces for palaces that, uh, that, that are all made out of stone, but that don't make uh, any architectural sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's uh, it, uh, maybe the approach of uh, exclusiveness is, is, is always something that uh, finds some uh, ways of uh, perversion. Mm. So I was going to ask one other question, but perhaps there are questions from the audience that we should consider. Is there anyone? Who either wants to speak or put something in the chat? <coughs> well, while we're waiting, I'll just uh, ask one other thing out of curiosity more than anything else. Your office is identified as uh, uh, existing both uh, in Bethlehem and Palestine, but also in Paris. And it seems to me that there are very interesting connections between those two parts of world, the world and the way in which uh, the architecture of stone has developed over many, many centuries. Both have obviously very ancient stone monuments. You yourselves have just talked about the role that the Crusaders played between France uh, and uh, Palestine. Uh, Paris, of course, also had an edict in the 1850s in which all of the new uh, Hausmannian boulevards had to be faced with stone and it was a local stone uh, that came from not very far outside of Paris until those quarries were exhausted and now comes from Burgundy. And there is in Paris in the last 30 years a tendency to use this Burgundy limestone uh, often just as a cladding, but as a way of identifying buildings uh, of being of a particular Parisian uh, style or quality. And I'm just interested if you, since you both have those uh, two uh, connections, if you would just uh, talk a little bit about um, the ways in which stone is used in a very, very different context, but one that has uh, a very deep history of its own. Yeah, um, I mean, for us personally, the the, um, the both situations are very different in the sense that uh, here in Palestine, I mean, the the, the projects that we've been doing uh, out of stone, I think, are practically impossible to do in France, mm -hmm. and at the same time, uh, the the, the know-how that is that exists today in France because they they. They, they preserved uh, a complete. Um, uh, um, they preserved the know-how they of stonemasons in France, whereas here in Palestine it's progressively uh, disappearing. Um, I mean, it, being in between uh, in between both uh, is is always a bit. Um, sometimes, I mean, sometimes you're. Uh, uh, challenged by the this uh, experimental approach that I mean it, it's it's always um, tricky because here in Palestine there's not only with stone but in the um, in architecture there's this uh, absence of framework that is that allows you to experiment more but at the same time is uh, it creates room for uh, for uh, uh, architecture that is a bit uh, chaotic and uh, an urbanism that is not completely controlled for different reasons but the absence of the absence of framework is there for different reasons uh, including uh, 
um, uh, loss of architectural references, political reasons, etc., and and. Uh, and, and, and this being compared to the situation in France, where actually you have a, a know-how that is, I think that the French, maybe with the Italians, are the best stonemasons that you can find uh, around the world. And But at the same time, you can't really uh, experiment uh, uh, to that level in France because it's, it's very complicated to get the authorizations. So there's a framework that is too... Uh, conservative from one side and from the other side there's a know-how that is disappearing but a framework that is uh, that uh, gives you room for experimentation so it's, it's it, we're a bit in between those two um now we're, we we didn't show this project but we we were working on a project in the um uh in the Sacré in the Sacré -Cœur in paris mm -hmm. to build the sort of a stone a, a small stone uh, footbridge in between uh, inside the church in between two uh, access points and um, uh, and, and it's a, a really funny project because the stone is going to be uh, imported from here but built in uh, <laughs> in the Africa. it's a funny funny situation because it's a sacred it's a sacred stone coming from Bethlehem of course <laughs> Once again, if I may, yes. Um, I wanted to maybe uh, use use the fact that I that I can ask a question. That there's this little bit of room to also maybe ask you to say a few words more about the wonder cabinet. I mean, you've in your work um, and in the many projects that you've presented, a lot of it also has to do with you know overcoming um, imposed segregations and, and hierarchies and um, and class systems and also you know the isolation that um, that Bethlehem and architectural discourse in, in Palestine can be um, subjected to given its uh, physical uh, separation from settler colonialism from the Israeli project from the rest of the world so you've you've managed to kind of keep um, creating collectivities that cross all of these different boundaries on the many different scales. And I get the, the Wonder Cabinet, as you described, it seems to be another one of these um, building collectivities um, projects. And I wonder how, first, like, how you see this influencing your, your practice as soon as you kind of move your office or your studio there and also um, if there's anything in the work since we haven't had a chance recently to catch up if there's any um, how, how do you see it launching is there anything in the works in terms of projects coming up um, for the wonder cabinet but i guess the main question is how do you see it influencing your practice i think during the last uh, couple of years so the, the practice was very much linked to producing uh, architecture in the, in the public sphere, but as well uh, with the ongoing research projects and local industries, there's like this growing interest in uh, in uh, the way culture is produced, uh, uh, how, how culture is produced nowadays and how different cultural uh, centers are operating. and. The, the more we go in time, the more uh, culture is becoming uh, institutionalized and having access to culture is becoming much more um, framed in very specific uh, boxes, kind of. So basically the, the, the idea of, uh, as well of the Wonder Cabinet, uh, very similarly to the, uh, the way the radio is, um, is um, being activated is to kind of try to deinstitutionalize culture and uh, try to seek opportunities. Uh, uh, to try to look at how uh, transversalities can happen in between uh, different uh, different disciplines. I mean, the way we, we see the Wonder Cabinet is basically a space where we can host different uh, disciplines, but as well, it's a space that can as well conglomerate uh, connections with all the other 
cultural networks that we have in Palestine, and cultural institutions that we have here, and uh, try to reach uh, results that are basically um, that we couldn't, that we can't imagine out of that kind of setting. Um, but as, as well, I mean, for now, for example, we are working on a certain number of components that are going to be hosted uh, in, in that space. Um, and so, so we're as well trying to experiment how this institution is going to run because it's a not-for-profit uh, structure. And it will, uh, one of the main focus areas is how, uh, how it's going to live and how it's going to sustain itself with itself without uh, being constantly um, uh, requiring uh, funding and um, basically looking at all the current, uh, all the mechanisms that would allow it to run without always being dependent on other uh, structures. So we have a certain number of components that will uh, be absorbed within the space, um, but mainly production and production going from being having the capacity to produce um, art uh, to produce uh, it would be as well it would be I mean the idea is as well to have the wonder cabinet acting as a label of production going from producing music to producing uh, creating links in between artisans and artists um, we will have as well components that will generate income such as small restaurant that will run as an artist residency so every four months we're hosting a chef and uh, that will constant, constantly um, uh, change. We're as well exploring the idea of creating a, a vinyl press. Uh, I don't know if you wanna add some stuff. Yeah, the, I mean, mainly I think the, the, the Wonder Cabinet is also an opportunity for us to, to um, question the, the way the cultural centers uh, or the, the, the culture, cultural institutions are uh, functioning. Uh, in the sense that, um, and in particular in our context where, where uh, every time you have a sort of a political crisis, the first sector that is completely uh, uh, silenced is the cultural sector. And, and we, we, we want for the Wonder Cabinet to be a place that is exactly the opposite. So a place to protest, a place that functions a bit like the radio, like Lias was saying, where the, the this place is is functioning uh, at its peak when nothing else is, uh, is 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 going well. So the the idea is that this place would uh, would be a, a physical space that that um, that is always and um, constantly uh, um, uh, uh, reacting to its environment. Not not, not only and I mean not, not because I mean. Um, the idea is not only to relate to, uh, let's say, Palestinian political stuff, but also to uh, 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 to protest other uh, this, of course, but also other uh, uh, relevant issues in 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 our society, uh, relevant issues in in the way uh, uh, the the industrial world is working here, uh, issues in the I mean. To, to expand this uh, sort of uh, uh, protest uh, and uh, sort of, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a sort of voice of protest uh, in, in a productive way. I mean, the, I mean, if you look at, I mean, the, I mean, in Palestine, but as well, if we look at, if we look beyond, there's uh, in, 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 in the field of culture, there's always a, a certain level of, expect, not level of expectation, but there's a specific expectation <laughs> of, uh, of a product that emanates from a very specific origin. And uh, th that has been like a huge uh, issue that we're facing in Palestine where it limits, it limited um, uh, the uh, ability to produce and to go beyond the limits that are imposed by the system. And this is because of the kind of institutionalizing, institutionalization of, of, of culture. And this is basically maybe the, I mean, the radio for us was, uh, an amazing uh, breath of fresh air because we didn't have a client, we didn't have money to, to deal with, and we were free to say whatever we wanted and to host, to host whoever we wanted. And so basically that kind of cloud of, uh, of uh, freedom uh, allowed uh, the production of, of shows or conversations that would have been- Whoa. For the first time.
Thank you. Um, is there uh, time for one more question? Um, so maybe one more question. I, I personally have to fly down to Cooper for midterms. And I think this is probably the case. And any more question is, is possible again. Yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll make it very quick. Um, I, I see, I, I was able, thank you for the presentation. I was able to experience your work as a re-territorialization of not only material, but craft and, um, and, and embodied knowledge and also program of, uh, the program of architecture in the city. And I was, I was wondering if you could try to um, kind of thread all these things together for us to, to um, put, put in a sentence, a paragraph or a, a shout what an arc, what 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 an architecture that makes sense for a liberatory project um, uh, looks like to you? No pressure. <laughs> it's a very difficult question, but maybe. I don't know if this is an answer directly to your question, but uh, when we visited the, <clears throat> at the end of the construction site, the, uh, uh, the, the courthouse of Hebron, uh, because we had the, this, this uh, whole issue with the way this, uh, this project has been uh, implemented, we also, I mean, we, we discovered some new uh, some new perspectives on the projects on the project that that were not initially uh, uh, foreseen, or at least for us. So, uh, and 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 basically, a lot of elements in the projects are not uh, exactly uh, like we designed them, or they're not exactly like we hoped they would be, etc. But at the end of the day, maybe the idea is that the project is not about uh, the form or the shape or the uh, the way it looks like, but more uh, uh, more essential than that. The maybe the the architecture is is, is more about the essential part of it. is is about the uh, maybe the way this uh, building is gonna behave in the far future, not in not in uh, ten years, but maybe in in, in one hundred years. And why how 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 can we integrate or how can we think about the projects uh, on, on that long-term basis? And that, that, that goes also with the, in opposition with, the, uh, with what today we call green uh, certifications and labels and all of that um, uh, trend in architecture that is for most of it uh, uh, thought as a 50 year long uh, certifications and processes of uh, building that for us somehow have their own have their limits because they 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 de facto think of a project as as something that should last 50 years they would last more but the the the, the certification at least is for 50 years so it doesn't make any uh, sense and reduces the the uh, reduces architecture to something that is not essential but something that is more cosmetic. So the, and, and, and the, I mean, stone is, is uh, I mean, when you build out of stone, you're not building for 50 years, you're building for 200 years or for, for more than that. And then you wanna use the stone that you built with 200 years ago to build another building. And, and maybe thinking of this far future is, uh, is, is maybe, now I forgot the question, but. Uh, <laughs> I, if I may, I think you've answered it uh, perfectly. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, we, we are coming to the end of our time. And, uh, and so we need to bring the session to a close. But let me just say on behalf of all of us who are here, and uh, certainly for Nora and for Dean Tarani, it's been an enormous pleasure to have you present your work, uh, to get a sense of what at least in my terms, is the full ecological implications of 
the selection of a material and an exploration of its full capacities. And we're very, very eager to see where the uh, next uh, pieces of research that you're going to publish um, will take you and uh, will take us. And we hope very, very much that there'll be an occasion to welcome you here in person, uh, let's say in the next six or eight months. So thank you again, really a marvelous presentation. Very much. Thank you for inviting us. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Shukran. We'll see you soon. <laughs> so thank you.